Good morning. Happy Super Bowl Sunday to all of you. Last time I wore a 49ers jersey in the service, we were in the Super Bowl against the same team three years ago. We lost that game. I went into a slight depression and then COVID happened. So, and those were all related. So I'm praying for a win today and you guys should be praying for one as well. I have a question for you. Does anybody have any goals or aspirations in here? Goals, aspirations, yeah? Any of those goals include being exceptional in their field, being exceptional at something. Anybody? I guess a, a good way to ask is do you want to be great? Do you want to be great at something? Like not just mediocre, but like excel and exceptional at it. Like I said, it's Super Bowl, it's an unofficial holiday for America, and we have two teams playing today, and I guarantee you this, they don't want to be injured, they want to remember their plays, but I guarantee if they pray, they're praying that they could just be great today, you know? Like they could just excel and be exceptional today, the peak of their craft. Now I got a question for you, is that bad? Is that wrong? Do you want to be great in your field? Like, do you want to be a great teacher? Do you want to be a great parent, a great spouse? Do you want to be a great engineer? I want us to look at a group of people who wanted to be great, and let's find them in Genesis 11. Genesis 11, 1 is where we'll end up. And we'll look at a people who wanted to be great. Now remember, this is the people after the flood. Like, Humanity had gotten so bad that God said there will be a worldwide judgment and that's going to be a flood. And this is post-flood humanity, okay? Um, Genesis 10 is a genealogy. That's why we kind of went past it. It's an account of families, and it's not necessarily the best preaching material. It's like a family tree. It, um, God gave them a task and they stuck to it. Be fruitful and multiply. And they did, right? They were repopulating the earth. So from 8 to about this time we're in Genesis 11, um, the scholars believe we're at about 900,000 people. So like less than a million in, um, in these generations. And in Genesis 10 we have this genealogy. The names read like ingredients from a prescription, Okay. But in the middle of the chapter, chapter 10, the situations of chapter 11 happen, right in the middle of chapter 10, all right? So Genesis 11 is right there, and it says this. The whole earth, after the flood, by this time, about three generations down from Noah, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And the people migrated from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So in Genesis 11, we have these people, one language. They're of the same family. They got off the same boat, the eight people from the um, worldwide flood. And this huge family is a nomadic people, and they are trekking through this post-flood terrain. The lifespan is longer, and about this time, they are adding new members to the family, and they head east. And they settle in this place called Shinar, which is in modern-day Iraq. Picture these people, men, women, children, traveling for a place to call home. And they stumble on this nice piece of land. They decide, let's settle here. Let's live here. Let's make this our home. Is that bad? Is it bad to want roots for your family? I tell you, um, when, I was in, uh, when I was a child, I moved 11 times, 11 times. And I said to Stephanie, my wife, I said, I really want our children to have roots. Because when you move that much, you don't have roots. So this people were settling in a place. Is that so wrong? They're a community now, and they had plans. They were going to build a great city, a great city. Now, one of Noah's grandsons was a man named Nimrod. Now, I know as you say it, it just sounds like a name we give to dumb people, right? Right, like Nimrod, right? But here, post-flood, 
This man, Nimrod, was Earth's alpha male, all right? He's your John Wayne. He's your Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's your Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He's your Chris Hemsworth, all right? Like he's, I just went all the way down a list of ages there. He is the alpha male, okay? And in Genesis 10, 8, we hear about this Nimrod guy. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He's the original alpha male post-flood. What gained him this notoriety? He had to have been a strong guy in stature, right? But let's read this next line here. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And so as you're trekking through post-flood humanity, right? Let's say Noah's 300 years. Let's, so let's say three generations down, maybe six, six to 900 years, right? Post-flood humanity, post-flood earth is bound to get vegetation and also animals, right? You guys following me? And as they're a nomadic people moving through the wilderness looking for a place to... We just lose everything? All right. All right. As they settle in Shinar, there were no doubt untamed beasts that they came across, right? Yes? And so, so their job was to protect from these animals. And these animals, this one, the petting zoo, all right? These are wild animals. And so you've got this guy, strong stature, who is a hunter, getting food for them and also protecting, right? And that's this guy, Nimrod. So good at his task that they made him a ruler. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. This is not uncommon. In ancient times, it was the mightiest warrior, the most adept soldier. In this case, the one who was protecting and the most um, strong in stature was made a leader of the people. And so he is a leader of this kingdom, and the kingdom's name was what? Babel. And this is where we are today. They said to one another, verse 3, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they improve technology in the midst of settling in this great city. Something in the clay in this kingdom in the Shinar Peninsula, modern-day Iraq, allows them to create a game changer. And you know what that game changer was? Bricks. Bricks and mortar. How much could you build with bricks? Maybe you could use stone or lumber before. I mean, the ark was made of lumber, right? Anyone ever here ever built out of stone? Anyone here ever built out of lumber? You got decks made of lumber, right? You could build a nice hut. You could build a nice shelter out of um, lumber. But what can you build out of brick and mortar? You could build a society out of brick and mortar. And so they have this technology, this new technology. Technology is good, correct? How do surgeons get good at what they do? Modern day surgeons. How do surgeons get good at what they do? It used to be there was three ways to get good at being a surgeon. Number one, on the job training. They cut you open and they learn while they're cutting you open. Anybody want that surgeon? No. Number two, cadavers. Dead people who aren't gonna mind anymore, they're dead, right? And they would practice on the dead people cutting them open. The third way surgeons used to practice was on animals. Then technology came around. And something called the ROSS, ROSS, was invented. And the ROSS is a robotic surgery simulator. What these are are virtual reality machines where surgeons can get the experience without practicing on me, you, and grandma, right? Is that good? Okay, I like that, okay? In fact, I want to know how much time as a surgeon you spent in the Ross machine, correct? Technology allows for great advancements. Life-saving technology in this case. And what we have here is post-flood humanity with ingenuity and inventing. Is that good? These people are thriving. This is amazing. What could go wrong? Verse 11, 4, then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city. And so they decide 
that they're going to build a fortified city with a tower, a great tower with its top in the heavens, with its top in the sky. And let us make a name for ourselves. Let's make it so that we're famous. Let's make it so that we're great. Let's be a great people. Technology has made a lot of people great. And so these people here in Genesis 11 are among them. This city is thriving. Nimrod is the king. And he gets his political leaders together and they make a decree. Let's build a tower. We figured out this brick and mortar stuff. You heat up the clay, you put it in the kiln, and it comes out as brick. And if you put the mortar in between, we can make this as high as we want. Let's build a tower you can see from miles away. That way if you travel, you always know your way home. Just look up. And if any other people come across us, they'll know we're a great city because who else has the technology that we have? And they say, yes, this is a good idea. We'll be famous forever in this great city. Is that bad? Anyone here come from a major city? Major cities? You've been to downtown of your city? What do you see when you go downtown in a major city? Skyscrapers. Skyscrapers as far as the eye can see. Great towers, right? Is there anything wrong with that? It's a great way to take advantage of real estate, correct? About 20 years ago, when I was a youth pastor, I was on a missions trip to Taiwan right? Missions trip to Taiwan. We did ministry with the youth in a reform school and at a church. One of the perks of this mission trip was going to a place that at the time was the tallest building in the world. Ever since then, Dubai has kind of taken over. I think they'll just keep taking each other over other countries. But this was a place in Taipei, and it was called Taipei 101. Giant skyscraper of a building. How many floors do you think Taipei 101 had? 45. Just kidding. No, no, it's 101, right? 100. It'd be funny if it was Taipei 101 and it only had 40 stories. 101 stories. You take this elevator that shoots you up like a SpaceX rocket to the 100th floor, and as you get there, you can even see this technology. There's an anchor system because what happens when you're 100 floors up? Anybody know what happens? Wind. Yeah, the building sways, right? And so they have this anchor system there to keep it when it's 100 stories up and the wind is kicking to just keep it in its place. It's technology. Technology is great. Is it wrong to have a giant skyscraper? Edmund, too many trick questions. I'm not answering you. Fine, all right, I deserve that. So they, ba- they decide, hey, we're going to build this giant society and this giant skyscraper right here in the Shinar Tower. Have you... Uh, have you ever felt like you're missing something? Like you get in your car and you're like, oh, I don't have my wallet or my purse, ladies. And you gotta go back inside. Or maybe like today, today you guys might be at a barbecue or a cookout because the big game is today. And you go to a barbecue and they're serving food. They say, get a plate, get a plate. And the host puts a burger on the patty and then you, you take the burger and you say, there's something... Something doesn't seem right about it, but it's a burger, and you put all your toppings on it, right? And then you, you, you crunch it together, take a bite out of it, and you go, wait, this is wrong. And then you open it, and then you look at your burger, and it looks like a roof shingle, right? It's one of those impossible patties, right? Like it's an abomination to God, right? <laughs> and you go, something's missing here. What's missing? Meat, flavor, like just, right? And you go, this is not right. We forgot something, right? Have you guys noticed something is off in this verse, in this chapter? What's missing? God. Like these people, post-flood humanity, about less than a million, 900,000 people. We're going to build a great society. We're going to be famous. And what hasn't been mentioned at all? God. And why build a tower? Why build a skyscraper? Why not build an altar for worship or a temple for worship? They say, we're going to build a tower. And here we see the sad truth that the post-flood people, Noah's descendants, have already defied God. They already disobeyed 
God. Because God had told them, was their job, what was the first part of their job? Be fruitful and multiply. Had they done that? When you get to about a million, that's pretty good, right? You're, you're fruitful and you're multiplying. The second thing they were supposed to do was to increase greatly on the earth. They were told post-flood to populate the planet. What did they do? They went to, oh, we like it here. We're going to stop right here. We like the soil. It's good for bricks. And we're going to disobey God. But God gave you a command. You know what we've got, though, that's better than that? Bricks. They had disobeyed God. What gave them the arrogance to disobey God? I'm going to show you here. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole of the earth. And here we see the great problem with these people. They were trying to reach heaven without God. And here's a truth about society. Humanity will always try to reach heaven without reaching for God. Society will always want the blessings of God. If you go to any battlefield or any hospital, you've got people praying to God because they want blessing, they want to survive, they want to live, they want healing. And yet, we got very few people willing to bow to God. And so we've got these people trying to subvert God to reach the heavens. I want to be great, I want to be famous, but you know what I don't want? God. And that was true, it didn't take long, did it, for Noah's descendants. That was true for them in that society, in that year, and it's true for us now in 2024. The problem with our society is we want everything that God gives, but we don't want God. We want long life, we want blessing, we want kids, we want family, we want a good life. We want to be God, but we don't want to worship God. That's true for every man-made religion and cult. That's the base for every moral, secular, societal standard. Let's have heaven on earth. Let's create our paradise. Let's create our utopia here. And what gave them the arrogance to think that they could do that? Technology. We made bricks. No one else has made what we've got. We made bricks. And here's a problem with us. Technology can fuel our disobedience. So, what will, so the first problem is we want heaven, but we don't want God as a, as a people. And then we have the nerve to say, I don't need God. I got what? My phone. I've got technology. They said, come, let's make bricks and burn thoroughly. We're better than everybody else, and let's show it. Let's subtract God and replace him with something else. How many of us can admit that technology has been a blessing and a curse? Anyone ever done something awesome on your phone? Anything, anyone? Okay, I'll just, okay. You could use your phones. They're awesome, right? You guys don't want to raise your hand? Anyone else done anything repulsive on their phone? Right? Just like, oh, what a waste, right? Technology can be great, and it can be a curse. Now, I'm not the guy. I'm not the pastor who says, oh, unless it's rolled in a scroll, it's not the word of God, right? If you got a phone, use it. You know how great technology is? When I was in Bible college many moons ago, and I wanted to look up the root Greek word in a scripture, I had to get books that were as big as this piano, right? put them on a table, and then I had to get another book as big as the piano, and I was looking through them like, like some Harry Potter scene, right, to find the Greek word. It took hours. You know what we did this Wednesday in small group? We clicked the link and got the Greek word within minutes, all right? It's amazing. Isn't technology good? Technology can be great, right? What's your favorite piece of technology? All right, don't talk to me. I'm, I'm good. I'll talk to myself. I... So one of the things that I really like about technology is the little um, the screen in your car. They call it the infotainment center. Anyone realize how much that's made your life easier? 
You hook your phone in, you got directions, change what you're listening to, change the temperature, all that. I found this out because I had a pastor's workshop last week. It was in Palm Springs, and I took my old school truck, which doesn't have that. And I had to drive through the storm to get there. And so my old school truck, trying to get to where I was going, I felt like Lois and Clark, right? Like I felt like I was on the Oregon Trail or something, trying to find my way home, right? Because I didn't have this piece of technology guiding me, right? Don't tell my old school truck, it's gonna hurt its feelings, right? But you guys know technology can be great. What's the problem here? The problem is sometimes we use technology as a substitute for God. We use technology as a distraction for God. Sometimes our society has gotten so arrogant that they don't believe there is a God because of the stuff they've invented. I don't need God, I got my laptop. We don't need God, we've created hydrogen bombs, right? There's no God, and this is the problem with Babel. You think that's a modern problem? That's a humanity problem, and it happened back then, and it continues to happen today, and I think you know that. So for the first time now, God shows up in this story. The God that they forgot is going to show up. The God that they defied is going to show up. And the people are building this great city, making a name for themselves. And as they're building this great tower, they're showing their greatness. Who acts? God. Verse 11, 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they're one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Not in a fear of like their ingenuity, but in their arrogance and disobedience, right? And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so that they might not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. What does God do when he dispersed them? What were they supposed to do in the first place? In this case, by the way, this is called a judgment. When God acts in these ways, the flood, um, any type of like um, disciplinary measure, it's called judgment. In this place, God's judgment on the city was to confuse their language and to disperse them. Dispersing them, basically putting them where they should be. Should have been in the first place. You guys ever read Jonah? It's kind of similar. Now, here's the thing. Language is important. I was in, I was in Taiwan on that mission trip about 20 years ago. I think it was a great mission trip. A million kids got saved. No, I don't know. But I was preaching to these youth, right? And I had a translator, a young college kid next to me, and he was, pre- and he was translating what I was saying, right? Every time he would translate, it went well. Sometimes he would go on break or run an errand, and then you know what happened? I was useless. I'm playing charades with these teens, right? I'm trying to communicate in other ways. Do you know why? Because I don't know the language. If you have a language barrier, there's a barrier in communication there, right? And so you've got these people. They didn't even finish their great building, their great society. They've been dispersed and set on the other places of the earth. God scattered them, and the nation spread from there. And so we're stuck with this, this truth that humanity wants God, but they don't want to worship God. Humanity wants to be great, but they don't want to worship the great God. Humanity wants the benefits, but they want to build their own benefits of God. You know what I'm saying? They use their technology. And we don't want that. We want to learn from this. This is a tragedy. As Moses is trekking through the the promised land, telling the newly freed Israelites about their history, he says, we don't want to do that. And us North Orange, we don't want to do that either. So how do we do that? All right, let's change some lives. Use technology as a tool to aid your faith, not as a substitute or a distraction. I mean, this is pretty specific, right? Right here in Genesis 11. Use it to aid your faith. Can technology be good? Can technology be a distraction? Can technology take you away from faith? 
All right, so we're going to use our, our phones, our apps, our laptops, our Zoom meetings to do great things, and we're not going to say, I don't need God, this archaic God, this, 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 um, this God of the past because I've got the ingenuity of the now and the future. What about greatness? We, t- we started by saying greatness. Was greatness the problem here? No. The problem is they wanted to be great apart from God. So, so to all of you in here who are studying for something, who are trying to, to, to get in a field, I'll tell you right now, be great at it. Like, be great at it. But don't be great apart from God. Be great under the great God. Amen? Think of it like this, God, how can I do my thing great, my field great, my, my job great? In the midst, make your name great. I don't want to be a great apart from you, God, because if I do, that's a problem. Do any of you have an old technology drawer, an old technology box? I got one. I got at least one, right? in my house. And in, in the old technology box, you'll find uh, like, like an old Xbox, right? You'll find um, old uh, wires to connect to the internet, the ethernet cords. You, got anybody got that? you know what I'm talking about? There might be a pager in there, right? Babe, this might come back. I need to save them, right? I don't know why I still got them, right? Um, there might be a fax machine or something in there, right, for some of you. A corded mouse. Maybe a phone the size of the bricks that were invented in Genesis 11, right? In that box. You guys have these boxes? You know what's amazing about that? 10, 20 years ago, you couldn't live without that stuff. And now where is it? It's in a box. Next to your 20-year-old's baby clothes. You don't even think about it. It's going to get into a landfill or an e-waste. Are you going to let those things distract you or take you away from the eternal living God? Every technology on your hip, in your pocket, over our eyes now, it's going to end up in a box. It's going to be obsolete. But God never changes. And if you bow the knee to him, you can be great. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, anybody listening today. I want to encourage, Lord, them, if they've fallen asleep, if they've rested on being mediocre, Lord, I pray that you would instill in them just a desire to be great, but not great apart from you, God. Great because of you, Lord. Would you make a society that doesn't rely on our stuff, but relies on the eternal living God? May we never forget who you are and your goodness. God, would you call your people to you? Open our eyes if you got to. Disperse us if you have to. Baffle our mind and our languages if you have to to show us just how futile the rest of that stuff is and how great you are. Because only you are good and the rest is just, it's just babble. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.